Yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Wes Scott Loudon, and I'm the host of Enlightened Channel on YouTube. I've been speaking on religion and religious experiences now for probably going on about two years now, I would think. Yeah, cool, man. Hey, what part of the country are you? I'm in Canada, actually. Canada! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And how long have you been there? You've lived there all your life or what? Yeah, I was actually, uh, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, and then uh, I grew up kind of in Red Deer, spent some time in uh, southern Alberta. Now I'm over in Tabor, which is a pretty small little dinky town, but uh, it's pretty good. Nice, man. Okay. Um, is any any part of that French-speaking Canada. No, I live. Uh, I live in the province that is called the Texas of Canada, where you lots of cows, lots of cowboys, lots of beer, <laughs> no French. <laughs> what, what What is it like, cowboys in Canada? What, help Help me out. <laughs> well, we Calgary has the Calgary Stampede, which is like big, big cowboy event, right? But uh, nowadays, I mean, you don't really have too many real cowboys. We call them drugstore cowboys, right? Guys who dress like they're a cowboy but have never been on a horse. You get a lot of those these days. But, uh, no, it's pretty good. I, I don't really fit in. I've always been a bit of an eccentric, you know. I like talking about religion and Hinduism and all kinds of weird things, which means I don't, uh, I don't really fit in with the cowboy image very well. <laughs> gotcha. Um, all right, well... Even when I was in Christianity, I, I, I didn't often get the feeling that people liked talking about it as much as I did. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, yeah. Which, which led me on my, uh, to the place where I'm at on my current journey. And oh, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing, man. People, people are uncomfortable talking about it, you know, and I, I think it's largely due to the fact that we know so very little, you know, and, and yet people have such strong opinions about it. It's, uh, kind of an oxymoron in that way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the fascinating thing about the religious experience is at some point in time, if, if you're like, I don't know, man, maybe half of the human race or 25% of the human race, I don't really know, but you get born into it and it's kind of like Santa Claus. Like everybody is cool when it's time to talk about Santa Claus. And then we do after all there's scheduled times for that. Um, and I don't know if, Canada, you're familiar with Santa Claus, right? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know, then when you go in uh, environments outside of Santa Claus, and then you start talking about people coming into your home and you know having these magical powers, everybody starts becoming a little bit more shy to engage with this topic. And I'm wondering if it's because that is kind of analogous to how we really feel about religion. It, we know when and where to talk about it. But when it's outside of kind of those prescription environments, we're all kind of like, yeah, but how do we engage with this material anyways? What's your take on that? Well, I feel like, uh, I, you know, a lot of myths that, uh, that people share, people don't get emotional about it. And I think it's because in a lot of ways, the ideas that surround a figure such as, say, Santa Claus, we, we know they're just playful ideas. Whereas with religious ideas, these come to help define a person's identity, their expectations of what will happen when they die. And so for that reason, there's a lot more of their identity invested into that idea. So that if you question it or you debate it, you are in some sense debating somebody's very identity, which I think really makes people uncomfortable, right? Calling the foundation of their ego into question is... Uh, a really uncomfortable thing to do <laughs> yeah it's absolutely uncomfortable um i went through that within the past year i deconverted from christianity so i'm very familiar with that all too well um it was a traumatic experience for me in some regard so did you just leave christianity about a year ago then uh less than a year ago yeah um what uh what denomination were you in non-denominational christianity at the time of my departure <laughs> Yeah, Protestant Christianity, uh, more or less. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, you know, I'm pretty, uh, I'm a practicing Roman Catholic. I was actually baptized Pentecostal, and I spent about, probably about three years as an atheist. And uh, I have this almost like a, a vendetta against Protestant Christianity, because I really think it's done a hell of a lot of harm. It's, uh, 
it's not a very good influence in the world right now. Is I shouldn't say that. There's there's some things about it that are good, but there are a lot of things about it that are not so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, so you are a practicing Roman Catholic then. Uh, let me ask you, how did you convert into Roman Catholicism? Well, I was uh, I was a practicing Pentecostal, and I started to study the Bible, and I studied it a lot. I uh, <laughs> I went in. I was I had no hesitation about asking questions. So I looked into creationism versus evolution, and and all of these debates. And pretty quickly, I recognized that the weight of evidence was on the side of science. And I decided to become Catholic because the Catholic Church is really a lot more open-minded about a lot of these things. Like the Pope has no issue with the theory of evolution. I mean, a lot of these ideas uh, are not a big shock to Roman Catholics. And Catholics are free to take the Bible much less literally because the Catholic Church is actually the institution that put the whole Bible together. So if you if you say to the you know a Catholic, you say, well, you know, this part of the Bible is quite good, but I don't know about this. That's not really a big issue because for a Catholic, the Bible was really something that was kind of, kind of brought together. It's not, you know, one cohesive unit all the time. Like, for instance, actually, Catholics have extra books in the Bible that uh, yeah. don't. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I was very critical of, of my Protestant faith. So I, I kept questioning and kept questioning and, uh, I used to go to my religious studies teacher at a Catholic high school, and uh, after about two years of arguing with him, I came in and I said, well, I, I hope you're happy because you've won. I'm joining the Catholic Church. So <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, man, okay. So what do you think? Uh, let's, let's shift a little bit. What do you think about a person in my position? So you converted into Roman Catholicism, and I deconverted out of Christianity, what is what is your take or view on a person like me? Um, oh, I, I totally sympathize because I went through the exactly the same thing, you know, where like I, I came into the Catholic Church, but I still had a lot of doubts, a lot of disbeliefs. And uh, I decided to leave the Catholic Church because I wasn't happy, because for, for me, it was all about experience. I was like, you know what, I'm not okay with believing in the invisible man in the sky. That's just you know, I knew that was nonsense, oh. but I also knew that religion was not likely something that was just invented by people. I, I thought there's got to be something to this. There's got to be, you know, some kind of an experiential route to this that inspired it all. And, and then the extra books in the Catholic Bible secured your interest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just enticed to get in there and dig through it. But you know what? Even even after joining the Catholic Church, it, it wasn't enough. And I yeah. actually left and I became an atheist. And uh, at the same time, though, I had had experiences, you know, as a Christian that I couldn't really explain. Like I had kind of a visionary experience once. I, I saw Jesus at one point and then it was like he was showing me the face of God, but it was my own face. Uh, and it scared the hell out of me as a kid, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was maybe like 12, 13 years old. I had no idea what the hell was going on. And uh, as I got older, I thought, well, you know what? I, I don't believe in the religion that I, that I believed in before, but I knew there, there was still some kind of an experience basis to that. Uh, and uh, I decided to investigate some of the other religions, mostly Buddhism. I was really curious about Buddhism because Buddhists are atheists. I've and, never gone to Buddhism or had much experience about it. Uh, what are your takeaways from that one, two, three? Well, Buddhism is mostly focused on experience. And this, you know, this is something you discover a lot of in India. I really believe that the problems that we face in the West as Christians the, the remedy is in India. In India, they don't even have a concept for orthodoxy. So if you go to India and you say, my religion is right, they'll laugh at you in a lot of ways because <laughs> for them, everything is based on an individual's experience. So it's yeah. not like, like for instance, we, we call it Hinduism, but there are actually four distinct religions inside of Hinduism. And inside of those four religions, you can have individual gurus who will teach different things. And they understand everything in religion as being referenced back to the experience of dreams. And so how do you tell someone that their dream isn't true and yours is? That's that's ridiculous, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, 
dreams are loose. They're free. They can move in different ways. And what I might dream about might be similar to what you dream about, but you can't really say that one dream is true and the other is wrong. But that seems to be exactly what Christians and Muslims have been trying to uh, to tell us now for probably over a thousand years. <laughs> I, I want to tell you something. Um, two, two things really quick. Number one, I am going to assert that dreams have no meaning outside the fact that they are a demonstration of something going on inside of our heads. And I want you to refute me on that if, if, if you think otherwise. But then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you also that I had a dream once uh, when I was a teenager that I saw Jesus and I was elevated above the earth. And in one of Jesus' arms, he had three triangles. This is all very like symbolic, right? And then he told me something and gave me a mission, at which point I departed from him. Again, we're hovering like in low earth orbit. <laughs> And then I went to what I perceived as hell and seen Satan along with two other, you know, lieutenants of Satan. And hell was very dark with the exception that there was light just around Satan and his two lieutenants so I could make them out. And I was behind a rock. Um, I could give you more details, uh, but this is a dream. So <laughs> that is you, very cool. Yeah, you've heard me in one breath say dreams are basically meaningless as it relates to our religious ideas. And I was a Christian then. Um, and then you've heard me tell you a story. So what do you make of that? Well, I would actually, I'd agree with you 100% that dreams are a reflection of what's going in, on inside of our head. And uh, again, you know, I, I have to do this a lot because the Hindus are just unbelievably wise when it comes to these things. But in Hinduism, they say that within our within our psyche, there's almost like another universe. It's it's the universe of dreams, and what they basically describe is that all of the gods are little more than sort of incarnations or manifestations of the psychological energies of the mind. So that you know when you're dreaming, what you're really seeing are the energies, the instincts of the body. And if you have a religious dream, then what's basically happening is an instinct, a very powerful energy of the body has come up and assumed kind of a personality. And uh, actually one of my, one of the most groundbreaking uh, religious documents I came across is called the Mandukya Upanishad. And in that book, what they say is that at the highest level, you have waking consciousness, which is what we're in right now and then underneath of that you have dreaming consciousness which is the world of the gods that's where heaven is that's where hell is which by the way matches perfectly with what your experience just described and then below that is what they call the void of dreamless sleep and this is the 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 empty void in which sort of the dreams take place and then inside of that void or perhaps beyond it is the white light and that's what people describe in near-death experiences so in the East, it's understood that all religious realities refer to this inner dimension, this inner cosmos, if you will. And science refers to the external physical cosmos. So you really are dealing with two completely different cosmologies. But in Christianity, especially in the West, Christians have become so obsessed with trying to produce evidence for their God in the physical universe that they've completely turned their back on those those ideas they've abandoned those ideas they've labeled it pagan they've labeled it as uh, heretical and evil and from the devil and they've really marooned themselves in the physical world so that they have no direct connection back to god and it's only in rare instances where god is finally able to break through and uh you know really really connect with somebody in a meaningful way but uh i, I love how you've drawn this kind of dichotomous reality of the external universe cosmos and then the internal cosmos um, my only objection to that as someone who is skeptical would be how do we know that there is an internal cosmos the way in which it's been defined by some of your more uh eastern influences how do we know that's not just us describing experiences that are actually a part of the external cosmos because these things are chemically happening to us and we are experiencing emotions and that whole sort of thing. And we're not just kind of redefining or compartmentalizing 
that part of the external universe and throwing a label on it and calling it internal? How do we know that's not happening? No, that's that's a really good question, actually. And you really hit on a big, uh, you know, that's a that's a big subject. And, you know, for me, the I, I love to use uh, my favorite reference to explain these things is to look at the nature of colors. And I, I do this a lot, you know, where if you look at you look around the room, right, you see colors all around you. But physically speaking colors don't actually exist there's actually a great video on youtube called uh, there's no such thing as pink light and if you look at it the spectrum of colors right they run from the infrared through the ultraviolet and it's a straight line you have a a straight line of different wavelengths with microwaves and radio waves and everything else but our experience of colors is like a circle you'll have that diagram of the color wheel right but that is a direct contradiction, right? Because there's a perfect continuity between our experience of colors, but the reality of light as it exists in the physical world is not a circle, it's actually a straight line. So what our brains do in order to solve this problem is they actually invent, it actually invents a color, which is the color pink. Pink does not actually exist. It's, it's totally invented by our brain to fill in this gap between purple and red. Now, if I asked you if pink is real, intuitively, you would probably say, yeah, of course, I can see it right here. But if I ask you if God is real, it's a much deeper question, but I think it's fundamentally the same problem. You're addressing something that really only exists in this internal experience. And you're, you're trying to ascertain a physical reality to something which is by definition not physical there's no way anyone will ever find physical proof for god it's if you look at the very you know if you punch in spiritual on google the very definition of spiritual is non-material and if you ask yourself okay well then what does that mean it has to mean uh, psychological because besides the material what else is there i mean the material is everything right but except for our subjective experience. That's the only thing that is not material, such as the color pink, right?